the next session as we continue our important discussion on FDI and the LDCs and how to best support IPAs in their development journey, we're going to turn our attention to climate FDI, which is obviously essential um, in general to development, survival, but also adherence to the SDGs. But climate FDI is a little bit under threat as global FDI flows themselves decrease. So to lead us through this really important discussion, uh, we have our moderator, Dr. Matthew Stevenson. He's the head of investment policy and practice at the World Economic Forum. And I'll leave the panel now in his good hands. Thank you, Courtney. Well, thank you to everyone for uh, joining us and thank you to WIPA for co-organizing this session with the World Economic Forum. Um, First of all, what is climate FDI? Because it's a, a, new, a new term that uh, has been used recently, but just so we're on the same page, what we mean by climate FDI is investment that is aligned with and supportive of climate goals. Uh, but of course, this requires potentially specific enablers um, for the governments to attract and facilitate this type of investment. And so, Today in our panel, we have representatives of investment promotion agencies that seek to attract and facilitate this type of investment, representing countries that are really thought leaders in this space. And we also have investors who are investing in the area of climate FDI. So we're going to have a conversation between the investment promotion agencies that mention what they do, what they to enable, facilitate such investment, and then hear from investors if this is enough, if they can do more, and then go back to the IPAs to hear about whether they can potentially support and facilitate this kind of investment more. So it's really going to be a dialogue amongst the panelists. Um, each, and it's a very rich panel uh, with people from many different regions of the world. So I think our, our panelists is excellent today. But before we get started and before I introduce the panelists, I just wanted to explain that we at the World Economic Forum have been working uh, on a guidebook that can be a future resource uh, in this space. We've been consulting with experts and investors and uh, practitioners, uh, World Bank, OECD, and you know, IPAs and, and so forth, including many on the panel today, uh, on what could be usefully done to what I like to say is create a climate-friendly investment climate to attract and facilitate more of this type of investment. And in this guidebook, we very quickly, we set out four things uh, that might be usefully done. One, to align incentives and de-risking instruments and strategies and, and KPIs behind nationally determined contributions. So this, the nationally determined contributions of a country can act as the guiding light to how to facilitate and the, the sort of the tools that IPAs might have. Two, to create a supplier uh, database um, to help link foreign investors to domestic firms, but to include information on the sustainability operations of uh, domestic firms um, and to help train them and provide capacity building so they reach certain standards of uh, environmentally good practices. We see that this will unlock a lot of investment because a lot of foreign investors, they want to manage their supply chains in a way that is responsible and so they want to be able to give contracts to domestic firms that are operating sustainably. Three, mapping uh, the commitments of companies, multinational firms, to decarbonize with projects um, in emerging markets that are green and that have been vetted and validated uh, to be low carbon. So if a company says we want to decarbonize our supply chains, our operations, well, we can provide here are projects that have been officially vetted by a third party to show that this can help them do that. And four, using international instruments such as international uh, investment agreements to promote, facilitate, protect uh, climate FDI. So using the legal and regulatory side at the national level and the international level. So these are some ideas and we hope to work with IPAs on this and investors because we really see this as a win-win if more investment of this type can be facilitated. With that, I'd just like to thank WIPA for its support of this agenda. We're also discussing launching potentially a climate investment alliance, which would bring together investment promotion agencies around the world that are, make a commitment, like a political signal that this is important to their economies, and also you know, would facilitate more investment from firms in this space. So that's, that's maybe by the next meeting we will have done this. So anybody who is interested in this climate investment alliance, 
may want to talk to us. So with that, let me introduce our panelists. Mr. Hossam Haiba, to my left, is president of the Egyptian General Authority for Foreign Investment and Free Zones, known as GAFI, and also vice president of WIPA. Hossam has more than 32 years of experience as an investment banker and direct investment professional, including working on FDI in more than 15 sectors. I'm keeping uh, introductions brief so we can go to discussion. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Hossam. Ms. Nangula Nelulu Waja is the founding ex chief executive officer of the Namibia Investment Promotion and Development Board. Nangula was with the PwC for over 27 years. She was the first black female Namibian to qualify as a chartered accountant, also the first female and first black Namibian to occupy a position of PwC managing partner and president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Namibia. Ms. Sujata Oog is with Invest India, where she's leading national subnational collaboration and helping implement the National Single Window Portal. She is also a senior advisor to WIPA and founder of GS Pace. Sujata has over 20 years of experience in banking, reinsurance, and investment promotion, and investment facilitation. Mr. Santiago Bañales has since 2016 been the managing director of Iberdrola Innovation Middle East. Iberdrola is global development center of digital solutions for the energy industry. And we started a conversation about why Ibedrola based itself in Qatar. I hope we can continue that conversation. I didn't quite get the answer and looking forward to learning from you, sir. Santiago has 25 years of energy industry experience fulfilling executive roles in R&D, engineering, product development, management consulting, and general management. Finally, Mr. Mohamed Yusriski, who goes by Yus, who is from Indonesia. Welcome, sir. Pak Yus is the chair of the Renewable Energy Committee at the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, known as Kaden. Mohamed has also been director of Basis Investments, a boutique investment company focusing on promoting renewable energy and creating funds for investing in the renewable energy space in Indonesia. He's also the head of investment at the Indonesia Smart Grid Initiative. So I took a little time just to share that these are really the global experts. These are the folks who know, know this stuff. So looking forward to learning from them today. So first, Mr. Hossam, Egypt recently uh, hosted COP27. So clearly Egypt is passionate about this topic. From your perspective as the IPA of Egypt, you know, what have you done, what can you do to facilitate more climate FDI? Thank you, Matt. <coughs> Thank you, Matthew. And um, well, uh, Egypt uh, has put in its uh, 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 what we call Egypt Vision 2030. Uh, one of its pillars was uh, uh, protecting uh, environment and uh, adjusting to climate changes. So uh, this was under the energy pillar uh, in which uh, we're trying to meet national sustainable development requirements uh, and to try to maximize the efficient uses of the different uh, traditional and renewable resources that uh, Egypt possess. Uh, and we try to employ this in our economic growth and uh, sustainabilities and uh, competitiveness as well as achieving uh, social justice uh, and uh, of course uh, ending up with preserving the environment. Uh, we do have uh, as energy resources, renewable energy, uh, solar uh, energy as well as wind energy uh, and uh, currently we're uh, actually as, as uh, we took uh, COP27 as the embark uh, embarking base to uh, launch our green hydrogen industrial base, uh, making use of uh, the location of Egypt uh, over overlooking two seas, uh, the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. Uh, so we're building up uh, desalination plants and uh, as well as utilizing our renewable resources uh, such as wind and, uh, and solar. Uh, we have signed uh, in COP27, we have signed 23 MOUs with major companies to uh, uh, construct and base their uh, green hydrogen, uh, brown hydrogen as well, uh, green ammonia uh, uh, projects in Egypt. Uh, nine of which uh, of these projects has been already uh, signed in framework agreements like shareholder agreements and they uh, land was allocated uh, to them and uh, currently they're uh, either under construction or uh, in their final uh, study phases to uh, start uh, implementing and executing the projects. 
We've also uh, tried to plan in our, in our, vi in our vision uh, that uh, renewable energy will, uh, will compromise uh, or comprise, sorry, com uh, comprise uh, of 42% of our total electricity generated by the year 2035. Uh, and the strategy is targeting to achieve 18% uh, reduction in the energy consumption. Uh, also, much attention, as I said, uh, was, is given to the green hydrogen, and we are also uh, focusing on certain areas where uh, these uh, uh, projects will be uh, established, uh, such as the uh, Suez Canal Economic Zone, uh, to make use of uh, the, this strategic location. We're also underway uh, to, uh, b uh, to uh, issue a, a bundle of incentives especially for this type of uh, projects uh, uh, and this will uh, these incentives will include uh, uh, some investment financial as well as administrative incentives for the projects and the companies interested in these in this area um, uh, lastly uh, Egypt is, is also trying to uh, through the cop 27 platform uh, uh, has been uh, working and supporting to uh, introduce uh, the African uh, countries as well in this, in this arena and has given platforms uh, for African countries as well as on the uh, Egypt's uh, 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 event that has been done 2022 as well <coughs> where uh, uh, the African uh, uh, nations has been given the platform to talk about uh, their readiness for energy transitions uh, and so on. So uh, Egypt is trying to, uh, uh, as much as trying to build for its own uh, country, our own national plan, uh, we're trying to contribute as well on the Middle Eastern, Mediterranean, as well as on the African front uh, uh, to uh, enhance and promote more and more of, of climate uh, FDI at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hossam. You, you use the words, you mentioned green hydrogen. Now, I know it's a very sexy, hot topic. I keep hearing about investment in green hydrogen. I think it would be great if we could dig into that in the panel today because we have some countries and, and companies that are experts in this. And that's why I'm going to move over to Ms. Nangula. Namibia is positioning itself uh, strategically also for investment in green hydrogen. Uh, what do you think, uh, well, what's been your experience to attract climate FDI in Namibia? Uh, and what do you think might be necessary or, or what's been helping you uh, attract investment specifically in green hydrogen or, or other climate FDI investment? Thank you very much. And I think that question or that answer, of course, comes with the role of the IPA and what we believe we are doing in this area. So we looked at engagement, coordination and partnerships, and I will look at it maybe on that level. So when we started, and of course we got to understand hydrogen, we under, needed to understand various contribution or national determined contribution of various countries, what they want to do with regard to their commitment to decarbonize the planet, and then what role can Namibia play? And what we then did is to really have quite good number of engagements. Engage the private sector, engage various uh, partners, engage uh, government and understand what is it that we need to do. And then after that engagement, we kind of then work towards coming up with our strategy. And But before we come to the strategy, is the coordination part of it and identifying the structure that we needed. And therefore, as a government, and uh, what Namibia did is set up an interministerial uh, committee. Because what we find out many times, we have got pockets of government agencies and government ministries or offices that are busy with their plans in isolation, but then they don't talk to each other. So we have got the Ministry of Environment, um, Forestry and Tourism that is responsible for Namibia's um, national determined contribution with regard to climate. Uh, and then, of course, it owns most of the land in Namibia that relate to forestry and that relate to uh, tourism. 
And then, of course, we have got the Ministry of Mines and Energy that is responsible for laws, regulations, standards, and, 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 and everything relating to energy. And then we've got the Ministry of Finance and Public Enterprises that deals with uh, whether it is working with financial organization. Then we've got the National Planning Commission that is responsible for coordinating Namibia's government development plan and so forth. And then we as the agency uh, that is responsible for investment promotion, uh, and then there's a, so there's many government agencies that need to play a role, and therefore what we saw was the need to have a better coordination and really sit at the same table. So what we did is make sure that government from our side, we are very much internally coordinated, and what our president then did is form this committee uh, where we serve and most of the other organizations that I have mentioned serve, and we've got inter uh, interministerial committee, and we were meeting almost like every two weeks to understand what is it that we want to do in terms of the development of the green hydrogen sector in Namibia. So with that one, we are the Green Hydrogen Commissioner who was really helping us in driving the strategy. And between the Commissioner and NIPDB, we were driving the uh, investment agenda for Namibia in that sector. So coordination at government level, understanding everybody what role they need to play was important. And then, of course, it comes to partnerships. Of course, we will not be able to deliver on the climate agenda and especially climate investment without forming good partnerships because many times you hear that it can be quite costly, especially when you're talking about green hydrogen and the energy transition. The competition between green hydrogen and oil and gas is a bit of a challenge because the price and the mathematics to support green hydrogen can be quite challenging. And therefore, you need commitment from various partners. You've got various governments, and you've got governments that are able to produce, governments that are in a demand position, and then, of course, you've got the private sector that need to invest. And therefore, what we need to do as a government is understand what laws, what policies do we need to put in place so that we are able to attract the right investors. We cannot have the same policies, for example, as oil and gas, where we charge levies in green hydrogen if we want to uh, promote uh, 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 the decarbonization of the planet. And therefore, that is the role that government need to play. How do we enable? How do we form good partnerships so that on the back of that partnership, the private sector can have an ecosystem within which to operate? So our government reached quite a number of memorandum of understanding, whether it is with the European Union, whether it is with the German government, whether it is with the Dutch government and various other government, whether it's with the Japanese or South Korean, where we see most of offtake will be coming from. So we form partnerships in terms of what are the potential countries where offtake will be so that then our private sector or people that will play in the Namibian private sector will have access to those markets. Having agreements such as with the port of Rotterdam because if we need to transport green ammonia from Namibia to Europe, we will need the likes of Rotterdam. So the government identified who are the key players in Namibia, who are the key players outside Namibia, who are our customers, uh, where or where will our customers be, and how do we enable this ecosystem where uh, uh, the private sector will be able to operate. And maybe the last point of, of, of it is de-risking the project, government has to have some form of, uh, of, of, of participation. And therefore, government committed to have a share in one of the first projects that are coming. Uh, we put together a fund that we call SDG Namibia One that we are using to raise fund funding because, again, it will be expensive and therefore we will need blended financing, whether it is financing, of course, from your normal financial institution, from development institution, from philanthropies and so on. We will make sure that we will attract it to that SDG Namibia One fund and therefore we will be able to fund government's participation. And de-risking from government side does not only come in a manner of government participation, it also comes in, in terms of government committing to the private sector on how do we uh, compensate uh, the private sector in terms of any government risk event that may happen in the future. So we looked at that one and we had good conversation and with that one we believe that we have set the stage uh, for private sector to work, but we could not do that without proper engagement with investors or potential investors to understand this is a nascent industry that we need to understand and we need to know what are the needs of the players in the sector, what is our 
not say, and what can we do to develop together between the public sector, the private sector, as well as uh, development partners. And that is more or less the approach that we have. Thank you very much, Nangula. That was very, very rich. I've taken notes because afterwards I'm going to sort of quickly summarize and then ask our investors if, if, this, wish, if this sort of menu is... Uh, is good enough or if there's more uh, that they're looking for. But I'd just like to comment quickly to say I think it's fantastic that we have representatives who were from industry who are now leading IPAs. This is the way it should be. You should go in and out of government so that the industry folks know what the industry needs and now they can help provide it uh, now that they're in government. This is a, a great approach. And I'm a big fan of um, a skin in the game of the government by taking a small equity share or something because then it shows that if it goes up if this investment is successful, everybody makes, is successful, and if it goes down, they also lose. So this is, I think, a big confidence-building measure. I'm a big fan of that policy. Sujata, India has played a leadership role in this space. In fact, we've been working closely with Invest India on these issues. Thank you to Invest India for the close collaboration. Uh, what can you share with us? You've also worked at OIPA on the Solar X Challenge, so you have a lot of learnings in terms of growing investment climate FDI. Uh, what's your experience? What have you done to do so? Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, so before I start, I want to give a few numbers in terms of India. So we are the uh, fourth largest installed PE capacity. We are the fourth largest solar capacity currently in the world. And we have all achieved almost universal electricity access and it makes us the third largest producer and consumer of electricity. And uh, thanks to this, and also thanks to the commitment through our NCDs and uh, uh, NDC, where we want to reach, reach net zero by 2070, we're also a very attractive destination for renewable energy currently. Having said all these things, uh, we also see that amongst the bulk of FDI we receive year on year, thanks. Uh, uh, we see a very, very small amount of money coming into renewable energy or into climate mitigation or adaptation measure. It is not that investors are not investing, but we also see that there is the flow of FDI is not equitable or not equal across regions. So we went back, we understood, and thanks to the WIPA platform as well, because then we are able to collaborate and brainstorm as to what are the challenges we face uh, when we are actually attracting investments into climate or into sustainable investments. So some of the areas we identified is like, currently there is no common definition of what do we call it as a sustainable or what do we call it as a climate FDI, and what are we actually measuring? There's, there's a lot of ambiguity and there's a varied range of definitions across the sector. So though there are investors wanting to invest and the investments are increasing, but most of them are going to the developed economies. So that's one of the key challenge we face. The second is like, there is no information uh, clarity as to if I want to set up a project uh, which is into climate or which is into renewable energy. So what are the regulatory requirements or what are the schemes or what are the incentives which are being give, given out by governments? So that's another challenging challenge we see. And also in terms of project proponents, how do I present my project which is appealing to investors? Investors are looking at attractive projects with stable financial returns. Uh, but in terms of developing countries and also LDCs, the main challenge we see is how do we present them attractively to investors so that you know the investments flows into the right project. Uh, in India, currently, we are working on various measures. The government has launched the performance li protection-linked incentive schemes in solar PV uh, to the tune of USD 3 billion. Uh, we are also launching green hydrogen. Uh, we also have a green hydrogen mission. We also have biomass policies and various other initiatives. So that is in the policy side where the government is engaging with relevant stakeholders in defining and also incentivizing producers. Similarly, we are also creating an enabling channel uh, thanks to the national single window system, which I'm also part of. So all these schemes and incentives, we are creating a single point or a single window where the investors can come and click and understand the incentives and understand the regulatory requirements of establishing these investments into the country. And as IPAs, we are handholding them, facilitating them to ground. 
these investments. So these are beginnings. We have a long day to go. But these are some of the initiatives we are doing. We are also trying to create very simple toolkits and frameworks which investors or the project proponents can use you know, to present their projects and also help them build those capacities in terms of presenting those projects. And as also one of the founding or uh, the chair of the International Solar Alliance, uh, where we are working with almost 90 odd countries as members currently, uh, we also have this successful experience through our startup. We were nowhere before to 2016, but when we started the Startup India in 2016, we are glad to say, and that is also housed in Invest India. So we are glad to say that India is currently the third largest unicorn uh, in the world in terms of startups and uh, MSMEs and innovation. So that is the learning we took, and we created a project called SolarX Challenge, uh, where we, the first leg we launched in COP27, and we launched it for the African region. So where we went out to share our experience in startup area, and also we wanted to develop solar capacity and have access to energy, trying to manage the gap through the International Solar Alliance. So we launched and we did a lot of capacity building across multiple stakeholders in Africa. Uh, with the IPA partners, we reached out through the WIPA platform and also through our bilateral arrangement. So we did a lot of capacity building to our member IPAs and also with the you know, local startup associations, local industry association to talk about what is that we actually need to do. And we identified almost 180 plus startups across Africa uh, to be part of this challenge. And soon we will be uh, in the culmination of either G20 or in COP28, we will be announcing 20 best startups which are promising where we will be incubating them, we will be accelerating them and we will make it commercially viable and also see how we can implement those solutions locally in Africa. So these are some of the interventions we are doing. This is just starting and there's much, much more to do. So that's where we are. Thank you, Sushata. And I, I see she's wearing green today in honor of our, 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 our climate topic, uh, and, and so is Santiago. Um, I, I think this has been great. You've sort of three big governments, very active in this space, have, been, have laid out sort of their toolkits, their, their measures. I'm just going to quickly summarize before turning to our, our private sector representatives. So incentives. Uh, engagement with the private sector interministerial committee to coordinate partnerships with offtake markets to create these markets for energy exports, de-risking through government share you know, participation, um, uh, de-risking through some uh, understanding of compensation should the investment not work out, clear definitions, good information on regulatory requirements, uh, single window, work with startups, local business partnerships. These are some of the things that these governments are doing to try to attract your investment, sirs, Amir Bedrola and, and uh, Indonesia, Kaden, is this enough? What could they do more? What would you like to see them do? I know in these types of events, the governments really look to hear from the investors what they need so they can attract more of this type of investment. Santiago and then Mr. Yus. Thank you, thank you very much. And fun. thanks for having us today. Just to make sure that uh, this is properly. Okay. So uh, first of all, um, I wanted to say a few words about Iberdrola, just uh, in case someone doesn't know in the uh, room. So Iberdrola is the uh, second largest energy company, private energy company in the world right now in terms of uh, market capitalization. So we are very active in the three, in the whole value chain of energy. So renewable energy generation, we have more than 40 gigawatts of uh, renewable energy, which is 80% of our capacity. The rest is uh, nuclear and uh, fossil, but uh, so it's 80% renewable, and we are aiming at 100% uh, by 2030 in terms of renewable, 90 gigawatts, that's, that's our goal. Then we have 1.2 uh, million kilometers of uh, transmission and distribution lines, and we are serving a population of around 100 million people around the world. Main countries are Spain, UK, uh, United States, Brazil, and Mexico, but we have investments all over the world, in particular in renewables and networks. 
So we have invested overall around one, 120 billion euros in the last 20 years for the energy transition. So it's uh, maybe the, one of the companies more committed to this transition. Our current investment plan has around uh, 22 billion euros in renewable energy investment and around uh, 27 billion euros in, uh, in transmission and networks. So this is a bit of our, uh, you know, our footprint. And then regarding incentives in, for our investment, I wanted to mention uh, five uh, themes. Some of them have been touched upon our, my colleagues here, but uh, some of them not. So the first one is very obvious. Uh, I will not spend much time on it, but it's regulation. So having a stable regulation, we make these investments. We build these plants. We expect to operate them for 20, 25 years. Uh, therefore, you need a very stable and long-term regulation and a market arrangement that uh, you know, allows for a you know, reasonable risk in your investment. That's very obvious, but I wanted to, to mention. The second one, that um, we are working a lot on it with different organizations, and also know, also know that World Economic Forum is working on that, is permitting. Permitting is a big issue because, uh, you know, maybe one power plant, big power plant can be done in 10 months right now, solar power plant, one year. But the permitting can take five years. <laughs> and if we talk about uh, transmission lines or other assets, you know, it can take decades sometimes. So we really need to work, we really work you know, all together, uh, government, private sector, and different stakeholders to improve, improve uh, the permitting side. The third, the third theme uh, for us is uh, policies and goals. And let me explain a little bit here. Of course, everyone has goals. And out of the uh, you know, conferences, we have these big targets, net zero emission 2050, but that's not enough. I mean, we need short-term targets. We need to monitor these targets. We need to have commitment for them, but not only from governments and having coherent policies to support them, but also from the private sector and different stakeholders. I mean, Iberdrola has put uh, forward specific uh, targets in terms of uh, development of, uh, or deployment of uh, renewable energy, but also in terms of, for example, we have committed to have net uh, biodiversity, a positive impact, not all our projects, by 2030. We have committed to have 100% um, recycling of our uh, blade, wind blades, and panels that will be the commission by 2030. So also we have commitments that are, and we, you know, uh, follow and monitor these commitments in order to, to have very clear signals to investors. So, and I think it's very important that, uh, and again, I don't want to say, you know, everything is for the, uh, the governments to do. No, no, I think the private sector also needs to commit and have targets. But the, private, the public sector also needs to have these public goals and have uh, coherent policies to support them. The third aspect I wanted to mention is uh, social license. Uh, Right now, for renewable energy, technology is ready. I mean, technology is there. We can deploy the, uh, the technology. It's not like 20 years ago, we had an energy crisis. We didn't know how to, you know, because we didn't have the technology ready to go. Now the technology is there. Solar, wind, is ready. The barriers are different. Barriers, for example, we, need, we have opposition very often to deploy wind or deploy solar in, you know, in the communities. We have to think how everyone can win in all the deployments that we do. That's why social licenses is very important. What I mean by that, I mean creating local jobs, uh, having something, you know, win-win situations with local communities. Um, let me give you one example. We have, uh, one thing we have done in Spain, and we have cooperated with government for that, is to create with a partner, a private, another private partner, a PV modules uh, manufacturing facility in Spain. So generating local jobs, technology jobs in Spain. It's going to be cheaper than buying the panels 100% from Asia or other parties. No, it's not going to be cheaper. It's going to be more expensive. <laughs> okay, but uh, you know, if you don't have this this kind of commitment uh, for both the private and public sector to to have this win-win situation with local communities creating jobs, everyone feeling that uh, they are winning, uh, we believe that uh, you know things will not come forward. Um, the last uh, topic I wanted to mention is innovation. So I said that uh, technology is ready in terms of wind, solar, but we have a huge challenge in terms of demand. What I mean by that is that you can deploy all the renewables in the world, but if only 20% of final demand, energy demand, is electrified, which is the situation right now, you cannot decarbonize the, the economy because you know, 80% still depends on fossil fuels. So, and what are the big uh, you know, gaps in this electrification of demand? First is heating, 
for buildings. So we need to you know, deploy more heat pumps. And governments can help having coherent policies to deploy more uh, heat pumps in, in buildings. Second one is transportation. Only 1% of total transportation is electrified. 99% you know, depends on fossil fuels. Electrical vehicles, creating incentives to, for adoption of electrical vehicles. And the third one, extremely important, is industry. Uh, only around 20% of industry is electrified at this point. We have the, what I like to call the pillars of civil civilization, like steel, ammonia, methanol, uh, cement, uh, concrete. All, all that depends on fossil fuels big time. So just to put a couple of examples, ammonia and steel. So ammonia, my colleagues were talking about green hydrogen. Iberdrola is really pushing forward green, green hydrogen. We, are, we have actual plants operating. Let me put you one example, which I think is a very good you know, paradigm of how to deploy these new products. Um, we have built the largest, uh, the largest, uh, sorry, largest uh, plant, hydrogen plant in Europe, in Puerto Llano, is 20 megawatts and, and uh, you know, electrolyzer. Now, what is important about that is that uh, one is a partnership with a fertilizer company. So it's the local production with solar batteries and electrolyzer and green hydrogen. But then there is an off taker, which is the fertilizer company that produce on site fertilizer and then it's sold in Europe, I mean in Spain, in Europe or uh, in anywhere. But it's very important, the off, the, the off taker, local off taker. Um, you cannot have a global market for hydrogen at this point. We really need off-takers and derivatives that you can actually you know, have, and have the logistic infrastructure to, to be able to deploy them. Um, and very important also, this project has been a strategic project for the European Union. That means that we have support at the European Union level, the government level in Spain, and the local level in, in Castilla where this company is. So again, I will say that these five topics, so a very important regulation, just to summarize, uh, regulation, uh, policies and goals, permitting, social license, and innovation. Thank you, uh, Santiago. That was perfect. Very concrete, uh, very specific, which will allow our government representatives to react to those five areas. But before we do that, Pakius, same question to you, sir. How is it going to invest in Climate FDI? What do you need in terms of good climate regulations, policies to support you? Thank you, Matthew. Um, well, from Indonesian Business Association, or we call it CADIN Indonesia, the Indonesian Chambers of Commerce in, 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 in Indonesia, um, yes, we believe that Climate Aligned FDI will be uh, becoming the norm very soon. Um, capital, uh, I think, is not going to be the issue. I met many uh, fund uh, investors who are really keen to enter the Indonesian market to do the clean energy, the renewable energy, uh, especially uh, considering that Indonesia has a huge potential of renewable energy. Uh, and I believe if you met uh, or hear any presentation from our government officer, uh, we have abundant of potential uh, renewable energy. But the big question is why we still at the 11% of energy mix in our you know, uh, grid. Uh, this is big question. In our works in Cardin Indonesia, even we, I just joined two years ago, but I met many people uh, from all over the world, and including the domestic uh, player. We never touch base the critical issue here, which is the market structure. We have market structure that is uh, roadblocks, so to speak, as to for this renewable energy adoption into the grid. So, since then, uh, I joined the Cardin Indonesia, or the Chamber of Commerce. We've been advocating the government, the, you know, the PLN, if you heard our state-owned uh, utility company, which dominating the market with 
over 90% of our, uh, our electricity supplies coming from the state owned. To have a better market structure. And I think I have to elaborate a little bit more on why this happened in Indonesia. We always use the paradigm of a supply and demand. That's number one. And this has been like uh, decades the way we plan the supply or generation uh, in our electricity system. And supply demand, balancing of supply demand somehow is not easy for uh, a renewable energy to enter into the equation. Considering the technical uh, the technical question on intermittency, grid capacity, resource generation, and some other technical issue uh, that we or they might come up with. <clears throat> but if you're willing to integrate renewable energy, those technical challenges, I think it's easy to solve, right? It's not, it's not an issue today, of issue today. So the second issue here, I think, emission factor is not yet a key performance indicator. Yeah. This is what we think today become an issue when the company in Indonesia, the principal, the likes of Nike, Adidas, H&M, and those you know, big companies trying to decarbonize their supply chain. Then we see another dynamics. They require renewable electricity. And they require lower emission from the grid. Right? So then the corporate buyers now talking to the PLN, our utility company, talking to the government, talking to us, to ask for help. How? They can have more an option, more option to procure renewable energy from the grid. This is the roadblocks. This is the market structure that not allowed them to have other ways of procuring the renewable ele electricity. So, with 80% dominate. The uh, coal-fired power plant in, in our grid, you can imagine how the grid emission factors that Indonesia or this system will give to any single company when they have to count their emission coming from the grid. And if you understand, today what we have only on the procurement is the REC, which is not enough, the Renewable Energy Certificate. So, again, um, this question now is how, uh, what is the electricity emission factor that will enable our business to grow, our industry to grow, our economy to grow? Because we know that electricity is a key right to to, oh, to, to, to the to the uh, our industry and this is what actually um, we've been working uh, together with the government with EPL and to have to open up more procurement option of renewable energy so then uh, within the market structure we still can you know juggling uh, to give more option for these corporate buyers uh, otherwise, we're going to lose a lot of businesses, industries. Let me tell you one single simple industry, the footwear, the, uh, how you call it, uh, apparels. This apparel footwear industry is responsible for giving minimum 3 million jobs to Indonesian people with $15 billion export per annum. This all at risk today because 
this industry consume electricity. And when those principles require their supply chain to be, you know, reducing the emission, then we have a big problem. So I think um, if you ask me, I may offer a suggestion to emission policymakers change this paradigm of supply and demand and have a comprehensive view on electricity supply profile by embedding the emission factors into the equation. Because we believe as an economy, electricity emission factors will be, if not already today, a competitive advantage in attracting investment. So, yeah, that's our challenge and our lesson learned. Thank you. Thank you, Pakyus. And a very interesting suggestion to allow uh, to create more markets for renewable energy, often take through the procurement options of the government opening up procurement uh, options to, to, to moving away from fossil fuels but to, to renewables. Okay, I would like to bring in now our government representatives again, but we don't have very much time, so I'm going to ask them just each very short interventions how what they think about what they've heard from the private sector and and how they can maybe address some of their needs and concerns uh, mr hossam please yes d d definitely these are uh, very uh, uh, noticeable uh, remarks and um, uh, requirements as illustrated and it, it's also taken into consideration when we're putting, for example, the incentives uh, that we're trying to attract the private sector uh, to, uh, what we did uh, in Egypt is that we built a sort of a public-private uh, dialogue in this regard, and uh, we uh, sensed the, uh, what the private sector would, would aspire to see at the end of the day. Uh, of course, in different, um, uh, different activities, they have different requirements and so on. Uh, for example, in the, in the wind farms and the solar energy, uh, almost all of the solar energy produced in Egypt is done through private sector uh, initiatives and projects uh, with the support and enable, uh, enabling uh, 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 policies uh, given by the government and uh, offered by the government. Uh, if we're talking about, uh, uh, this is for solar and wind, uh, if we're talking about hydrogen, it's the same. I mean, we don't have a single investment by the government in this, uh, in this particular source of energy. Uh, but we listen to the private sector and we try to accommodate the requirements in terms of, as you correctly put it, uh, the terms of regulation, in terms of the policies, uh, and we adopt these uh, 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 um, requirements to our uh, to our regulations and policies. The challenge here is the uh, pace and uh, the ability of, uh, of the government to satisfy such requirements in a short period of time as aspired by the uh, private sector. So that's one of the challenges that we are trying to avoid here uh, by uh, avo uh, applying sort of a flexible mechanism uh, to uh, 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 quickly adapt uh, the current and future regulations uh, for private sector needs. Fa uh, I think uh, um, this is the real challenge, and I think uh, some uh, and lots of the IPAs I've talked with, uh, they are thinking the same along the same way, and I think this will be resolved in, uh, in a, a, a very very soon. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Hossam. In fact, if I noted correctly, Santiago said sometimes permitting could be done in eight months and sometimes five years. If you get it down to eight months, you might attract his investment. If, you, if it's five years, you won't. So it's just in terms of timing. Ms. Nangula, please, what did you think of what you heard? No, I think uh, that message is in, is, is, is in line with the message we are hearing. I think, like also indicated here, uh, from our side, we, uh, we, when we started this body, uh, which was two years ago, we had almost a temperature check of really what does the private sector say and especially if we look at Namibia's competitiveness and ease of doing business, it, it, it is poorly ranked. What is the private sector saying? How do we listen more? What can we do to make sure that we are responsive? And the message we are getting is the same as we have gotten here this morning. And therefore, yes, it's a message we understand, but 
how fast can we respond to that message? Uh, and uh, I, I like the five points that were given by Santiago because then you've got good five points, one, two, three, uh, and in yes, you can explain quite a number of them. And if one looked at it, then is yes, it's points that we understand, but it's things that you are working because if you want to change a regulation in a country, then you've got the executive that does ABCD. It works a bit slow, but how can we be more responsive and more innovative in our thinking that you kind of need to start working on something before you need it, so that by the time you need it, uh, then you are able to respond on it. Uh, the other thing that we need to do is also just to have more kind of to work on a base of trust and, and, and cooperation between the public and the private sector. Because sometimes we, feel, we believe that our interests are not necessarily aligned, and therefore if we come to the table, we think, you want taxes and you want profit, and how do I get more taxes and how do you, I get more profit? How do we make sure that maybe if we remove us and we leave the society, and they want more jobs and they want more ABCD, and then we can get what we want, while at the same time both of us delivering to those that actually give both of us the license to operate because it's the society that gives government the license to operate and it's society that gives the private sector to operate. So maybe if we focus on their needs and remove our own needs, we will reach a better deal uh, uh, in, in, in that uh, conversation. So really, I think it's like, yes, listening more and not once because sometimes you listen last year and then you work on it and then you drop the ball and you need to hear it again and say, oh yeah, uh, by the way, I, I, I still need to up my game, permitting uh, a challenge because yes, um, it, it takes quite a bit of time because you need many bodies and what we were talking about, for example, in green hydrogen, we are trying to bring together um, one institution, we call it the implementation office. Uh, and that implementation office is how can we have more permitting centralized in that implementation office, especially for green hydrogen, if it's a nascent industry that we want it to grow fast so that we can have ministries supporting this agency in delivering better and faster to the industry. So yes, in, we must be innovative in our thinking and our solutions, but I think yes, and, and listen and engage more frequently. Thank you, Ms. Nangula. I think the social license dimension you talked about of what's good for the people is something we can maybe have another session on sometime because that's what I keep hearing and I think it's not enough work has been done in that space and Iberdrola, Santiago's talked about that, creating the, the jobs, even if it's a little bit more costly to create the support of society for the project. I think maybe we can, some in the future, discuss that important topic. Sujata, please, how is uh, Invest India going to attract and support Iberdrola and Caden to invest in India on these topics. Okay, so it's quite insightful uh, conversation. Uh, just a few things we, uh, as policymakers, we do acknowledge that these are some of the challenges uh, which we are all facing together and we need to address. Uh, like say for example, social uh, licensing, or how do we involve the so society so that we uh, transform the energy or we get into uh, transition phase very successfully uh, it comes so we are working from all perspective our honorable prime minister mr modi so he's launched this life initiative in the cop also recently mr singh so this is a lifestyle for environment so wherever there is a discussion or there is a deliberation which is happening even with the with each of the citizen in the country so the lifestyle which is environmental friendly is being spoken about. So that's some of the changes we are bringing in systematically into the way we interact with each other. Uh, similarly, when we are talking about solar, uh, when we are talking about wind energy, we also realize that creating the right infrastructure is essential even for the private sector to successfully transition. If I need to procure renewable energy, do I have the basic infrastructure to procure it? So that's again another area which the government is investing a lot. And uh, recently, we are building this green corridor, energy corridor, to a tune of USD almost 7 billion, where we are trying to enable access or uh, into the traditional grid lines. How do we connect the wind and solar energy so that the distribution is comfortable and everybody can access. Though I may have a target of 
getting into net zero as a company, as an investor, but how do I get access? So these are some of the enabling areas we are doing. We understand that they are all very, very crucial to the whole holistic approach for this uh, transition. So we are working on it, and uh, I'm sure we'll all come evolve or emerge victorious at the end of this game. Thank you, Sriratha. So uh, we've run out of time, but I think it would be only fair to give the last word to our investors if they have a couple sentences, final thought, how they see this topic, what they want to leave us with. We're going to go with Pak Yus and then Santiago. Pak Yus, what do you want us to take away from this? Yeah, um, let me share the, the dream uh, of Indonesian golden era. We're going to be 100 years uh, old uh, nation in 2045. We want to be, uh, we want to be the fifth largest economy in the world by 2045. And by then, I think we believe from Indonesian Chamber of Commerce, we cannot be the fifth largest without having uh, Indonesian company becoming, you know, SBTI validated company. We heard from SBTI there will be 10,000 between 2045 to 2050 company validated. That's their target. So now we also targeting to have at least three percent of those 10,000 company globally coming from Indonesia validated SBTI validated company. So by doing that then we believe more trading, more trades will come to Indonesia. Otherwise, there is nobody want to do trading with Indonesia. That's, that's uh, the, the, the vision because we believe this is the only viable pathway for Indonesian company, for Indonesian economy to grow. Which Thank is you. Net zero pathway. Thank you. Thank you, Pakius. Santiago. Yes, thank you. So first of all, I wanted to thank you, the different information agencies in this table, for the ideas and the, uh, the energy, <laughs> energy <laughs> that you are putting into into this, which is key for the uh, you know for the future of all of us. Uh, I just wanted to say maybe a, to finalize a positive word in the sense that we are always thinking about how we can improve, but also we have to recognize that a lot of things are, are being done <laughs> and are being well done. Uh, for example, uh, Iberdrola, we have signed an agreement with the investment, investment promotion agency of Qatar, where I, you know, my company, in order to promote innovation locally in Qatar, which is working very well. So we are doing, you know, a lot of things. So you are doing a very good work. I mean, there are things to improve, but of course, uh, we have a very good work. And I, I would like to have a final comment on, on the fact that um, I think very often the promotion agencies and government in general they need more resources to get things done. Uh, sometimes you, you know, there are very the goals are very, are very aggressive and everything, but then, you know, you need people, you need resources, and I have seen situations where you say, come on, I mean, you need to have a good team in order to, to do all these projects, and sometimes also you have to consider that. So I will say that, you know, ask your governments for a good budget <laughs> to get things done. I, I think that is music to our ears of uh, Ishmael and his team at WIPA, who, you know, help coordinate and support investment promotion agencies and who always argues for the, how critical they are in this ecosystem to help investors be successful and help countries attract investment. I'm going to leave you with one thought. I want to first thank you to all our panelists. I think they are experts in their field and really appreciate it. I think one of the sort of the takeaways here is we need a standing mechanism for investors and, 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 and countries to talk to each other maybe every quarter uh, because things come up. Uh, we don't have all the answers, but there'll be questions that will come up. Maybe, maybe everything goes well. Maybe there's something that needs to be addressed. But why don't we have a, a standing mechanism so that these conversations can take place in a predictable way? Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you to the audience, and have a great day.